Hello, everyone. Um, so we're gonna present this work. Oh, sorry, fuck. This um, platform is called Bella. Um, we're gonna do a short, not that short, workshop after that. And so Bella is an embedded platform for <coughs> audio and sensor processing. Uh, that's been developed at Centre for Digital Music at Queen Mary University of London, by mostly by people that are not here. Uh, as in, started uh, with work from Andrew, by Andrew McPherson and Victor Zappi a couple of years ago. And they had to make a hackable musical instrument, which should probably be somewhere. Well, I'll, show, I'll find it later. They had to make a, a hackable musical instrument where you could uh, sort of break out the internal connection of digital musical instrument so that people can hack them, could hack it on a breadboard, like as if they were doing circuit bending on an analog uh, instrument. And to do that, you, had, you needed a few things, like you needed pl plenty of IOs, possibly at audio rate or similar, so that you could use uh, uh, normal values of capacitors and resistors to actually make some, something happen. And you need low latency because there were multiple in and outs and you, you needed the, sign the signal needed to go in and out a few times. Um, and that's why this platform was designed in the first place. And now we just released it to the rest of the world as a platform for audio, generic platform for audio and sensor processing. Um, we did that through a Kickstarter campaign that uh, was closed and that ended um, 10 days ago or something. And so, yes, let's see what it is. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, you see I rehearsed the slides very well. Um, so, um, uh, the idea was to get away from cumbersome um, uh, solutions, like having an Arduino plugged into your Raspberry Pi, um, so that you could read them through pure data. So you could read the, GPA, the, the digital inputs through pure data to make some sounds. Um, or having it plugged into your laptop or your... Or your um, general desktop machine, um, um, or using Raspberry Pi on its own. Each of these have different levels of, um, uh, different reasons why this platform, get that, and this platform sort of uh, tries to you know, tie all them together. Um, of course, on the Arduino, you can't really do any serious audio processing. You, you just don't have enough power. But you have the advantage of being able to connect to, at very low level, with any sort of hardware. On the Pi, uh, I guess you could do pretty much uh, similar I.O. stuff. You have digital GPIOs, you probably have um, analog ins as well. Um, but it, it's an embedded platform, so it's great because it can be embedded into uh, musical instruments and sort of things. But you need a, a, a custom environment, as we'll see later, to make the thing actually work. Uh, properly. Uh, I, I tried to run Raspberry Pi with a USB dongle as an audio in and out and I was getting some uh, some 50 milliseconds latency with, um, with with PD so that wasn't really something useful uh, for playing music. Of course you could use, you could use a, your laptop but again you would you would lose at that point a con low level connectivity and this platform tries to package everything in a convenient package which is built on top of a bigger bone black. We actually use a stock bigger bone black and uh, a custom um, cape, a uh, custom Bella cape that comes with those eight analog inputs, eight analog outputs uh, sampled at 22 kilohertz uh, you can actually reduce the number of channels to get higher sampling rate. These are DC coupled, uh, string, DAC, and uh, what's called again, successive approximation um, ADCs. So they're a bit noisy, um, but they're very fast. They have no built-in, uh, uh, there's no latency associated with them, as in, uh, as it as instead is the case for the audio codec, because we also have audio input and output, stereo audio input and output, but these converters are sigma delta, so you have a round trip latency of the converter itself that's around 38 samples. We'll talk about this a bit more later. Uh, so there's a custom software environment that, that that's, match, that's matched with the cape that actually is based on the design of the of the um, of the audio cape for the big bone black, but doesn't even sh doesn't have a, an ALSA driver. You can't use it as you would use a regular uh, audio interface. Simply by, because of the fact that we're bypassing the audio kernel using the Xenomine extensions to get uh, to give the audio thread a much higher priority than the Linux kernel. At that point, you couldn't go through ALSA. And this allows you to achieve a buffer size of two samples, which may be, which brings you to less than one millisecond relative latency for the audio. 
uh, and that one millisecond is mainly due to the latency to the um, filters in the converter. You could get to rest less than 100 microseconds round trip for the for the analogs if you really want to. Um, yeah, so the sensors, the audio, the uh, analog inputs and outputs are sampled at 22 kilohertz, which is pretty remarkable, which means uh, you can do sort of audio rate IOs there, for instance, you could use them for, uh, you probably wouldn't want to use them in the audio path, even though you can, uh, but you may want to use them, I don't know, for some side chain uh, on a compressor, for trigger inputs, those sort of things, uh, from, from a, a piezo, for instance, or, or, just, or just to get to a 22 kilohertz sampling rate from an accelerometer so you can properly filter the data. Uh, these are synced up by the audio clock, so they're aligned, and we're also using the onboard GPIOs, 16 of them, uh, to get also 16 digital inputs and outputs, or inputs or outputs. Um, the Xenomai software, uh, the Zenomai, the, on the software side, uh, Xenomai extensions allow to give the audio thread higher priority than the Linux kernel, as we mentioned earlier. And so in practice, you get a real-time audio environment. So you get the same uh, real-time performance of a microcontroller, in a sense, because the, the kernel, what the kernel does can't interrupt your audio. Uh, but at the same time, you get the full stack of Linux if you need to do anything like storing files, doing network, uh, SSH, in, uh, compiling on the board, those sort of things. Uh, right now, so we it started using C and C++. Now there are ways to run pure data patches on it, using a couple of things we'll see later. And recently we had the support for Faust. And we're working on getting Super Collider done, and, but there's more on this later. Uh, we targeted mainly to musical instruments and live audio performances and uh, you know uh, music installations would be the, the whole thing I mean the kit, the thing the, the kids sold on Kickstarter for 110 pounds or something like that including shipping um, so yeah, if you need to do a, a musical installation it's much better to leave one of those rather than your laptop I guess um, but the guys over there, oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, I'm Julio, and Liam is over there, and Astrid is over there, we're all from the Center for Digital Music. Um, uh, yeah, they, they used it for a kinetic sculpture, where they were controlling stepper motors with it. Uh, you can use it to do vector graphics on an oscilloscope, all sorts of things. Uh, go to the website to see a few examples of that. Um, we already mentioned this, we bypass in the Linux uh, kernel using Xenomai, but still you can use uh, USB for instance, uh, the media over USB is available uh, just like with, with, uh, with the standard, uh, with, through the standard Linux API. Um, good, uh, so not everyone may be familiar with Xenomai, I wasn't before starting working on this project, and I'm not an, an expert just now. But what I found is that there are a few things that need to be, uh, you need to be concerned of. Uh, which s partly apply to general uh, real-time programming, but some of them don't. Um, so what the, the Xenomai uh, scheduler can do is can interrupt the kernel even in non-preemptible operations, which is something you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. This allows you to get back to your audio callback every time you need it, even um, at very small intervals. And the thing here that's called mode switches. So a Xenomai thread is just a thread that's, uh, that's scheduled by the Xenomai scheduler. And it should run always in, well, it doesn't have to, it should, it, it's not that it should run. But when it starts, it runs in Xenomai mode. And that allows you this, all this whole uh, high priority thing. But if you do something that goes through the kernel, then it will have to switch into kernel mode. Now, each of those switches carries an overhead, which is bad and also makes it more difficult and also it takes more time to reschedule um, to, to um, wake up uh, a thread that is, that's in, in um, kernel mode. So you want to avoid mode switches if possible but you also want to make sure, you surely want to make sure your audio, audio thread has no mode switches. So of course you need to avoid disk I.O. and socket I.O. and printfs in the audio thread but we know this already from well, actually, you, you, you would occasionally put printfs in your audio thread, and if you just put, put a couple, it's not going to be a big mess in a, in a regular, real-time um, programming environment. But in this case, a printf would trigger, would trigger a, a switch, mode switch, and that would be much worse than regularly. So there's alternatives. There's a function, as in my function, is called RT printf. That does exactly the same thing. Um, pthreads would call the same issue, and 
uh, we found out in while working on SuperCollider that available that uh, there was a um, conditional variable uh, C++ thing uh, the, when you try to wake up a, a thread using notify one that would also trigger mode switch so that's not something that would necessarily be bad as a general rule unless you're using Xenomai, in which case you need to work around these things. Uh, this is the board layout, change a bit. We don't actually have the old GPIOs here, it would be great, it's just all over the board, but this was better for commercial purposes, I guess. Um, connected embedded fast, and hopefully easy to get started, we'll find out. Um, the, the API, so again, I said, I mentioned there are various ways of running it, of writing code for it, but it's, it all gets wrapped into this uh, C uh, interface. So you have a setup function where you do, guess what? You have a render function, that's the audio callback, and then you have a cleanup function at the end. So it's pretty standard under this regard, and if you have something that's running on a different API, you probably have similar functions to call. Uh, so our website is down here, it's bella.io, and if you go to slash code, you'll find all the documentation for the code, the source code, and the lecture the slides for this presentation, uh, examples, and sort of things. Um, sorry, I moved, I moved around the slides and, um, and I get surprised by these things. Uh, this is sort of what I mentioned earlier, you get um, the few reasons how, how the latency adds up. But we don't need to care about this just now. Oh shit, what's happening here? Oh yeah, nice, I like this one. I didn't make the animation. So, well, this just shows you that uh, that's simple double buffering. Um, so we're using double buffering, of course, so you have time, one buffer of time to do your computations while uh, the, um, something else is reading uh, the inputs and writing the outputs. And I didn't mention this so far. The, big, the reason why I went for the big one black, actually, was that there's an onboard microcontroller sort of thing, it's called the PRU, Programmable Real-Time Unit, that's inside the, uh, the same chip that holds the ARM A8 core. And this programmable real-time unit is a programmable real-time unit that runs at 200 megahertz as a limited set of instructions and can share memory with the main uh, ARM core. And that's the great part. So we're using that PRU to communicate with the audio codec and, with the, and via SPI to the DAC and the ADC to get the samples in. These are written to a location in memory and then we set a flag or, or send an interrupt to the ARM core that will know that there's a new block of samples to be processed. Uh, amazing. Uh, well, we generally use interleaved uh, date, the interleaved format for the. I mean, at the moment we use interleaved format. We may switch to non-interleaved or give an option later. Um, so yeah, we have, as, as I mentioned, we have eight ADCs running at 22 kilohertz, uh, two audio running at 44.1. So you see, we have every uh, two audio frames, if you consider a frame an LR pair. Uh, if it's two audio frames, you have the whole eight um, inputs and outputs. And I think that at this point, we can give out the kits. So we had 25 of them. You'll need a machine. Uh, hopefully, on Linux will just work. You just plug it, the USB in, and you, you're online. Um, on Mac, you'll need to install some drivers for USB tethering. And they've had some big issues lately, so good luck. Um, we, we give, we're giving out the kits and then uh, see how the thing works. If you can take cords around, that'd be great. Hmm? If you can take cords yeah. I'll do that in a second. So in the meantime, if you want to go to, uh, sorry, if you want to go to our, good. if you want to go to our website, um, go to bella.io slash code. I should have put the link here. There you go.
go. Good, so if you want to go to bella.io slash code, you, we probably put together all the instructions you'll need, and you'll tell us where the bugs are. Has everyone got a USB cable? Yeah. Uh, sorry, are there any questions so far about the structure architecture thing? Sorry? I'm sorry about that. We, 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 we didn't translate it. Oh, well, uh, of course, the, I, I can't tell you where, where you can change the language. I mean, I can um, uh, look, look somewhere up there, maybe. Well, anyhow, um, there's not going to be text in, in, in Russian, so if you want to go to the wiki... <laughs> Sorry about that, it's not... <laughs> Sorry. Um, so if you go to the wiki, which will be the one, two, three, four, six, six, seventh, uh, then you'll find what you need. Okay. Good. So make sure before you plug the big one in, of course you already did, uh, but make sure the SD card is pushed in, otherwise it will boot from the embedded memory. Good. You'll, you'll want to download the files from the, uh, from the files section. Um, uh, I should. I think I put. I, I put it up. Maybe I didn't update it. Maybe I didn't set it available for you. Yeah. Yeah. There's the Bella Minilac .tar archive. I thought you would like the tar archive. It's on the fa files sec uh, download sections section. Despite the road files here, maybe that's what it's called. Yeah, it's called files. <laughs> Okay, in that tar archive, you'll find a copy of the repo, which is available otherwise uh, through the repository here, through with a mercurial uh, clone. Um, and there are a few more things, not much really. Um, but yeah, I thought it was handy to provide it. Um, mm, 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 mm. Good. So if you're done with it, uh, you, though Mac users, if you go to the wiki and you go to... Um, Getting started with Bella, that's where you'll find the link to the um, drivers. This is your link. And if you're on El Capitan, uh, let's hope it works. Uh, wait for anyone to be at this point, or should we just carry on? Good. So, good. So, hopefully, most people will be online at the moment. I mean, I didn't say what online means. It means that you can SSH into the board. Through uh, at the address 102.192.168.72, and or more simply, you could just open up your web browser and type the same address here, and go to pay to port 3000. 192.168.7.2, colon 3000, and if you hit enter there, and my board is not faulty, and oh, I need to. If config it up, I think. Yeah, root. No password. Yeah. Uh, one, sorry. So, 
I don't know if on my board the ID is for whatever reason not running. Uh, I don't think so. I, I don't even know if the, FT, if the FTDI driver is actually needed. I put it there because it's in the instruction on the on the on the Beagleboard website, but and I never tried without. Yeah, the horn. This is. There you go, and you should show be shown something similar. And I think I'll let Liam on. So you don't. Oh, oh shit! It's, it's, it's passing through my body. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can use the hand. The hand mic. Oh yeah, can we switch? Dave. Or can we switch to the hand uh, to the handle, or or use the handle microphone? Maybe it's ready. Okay, so to use the um, web browser-based IDE, you don't need to install any of this software apart from the drivers. You simply need to open up a web browser and just go to the IP address on port 3000. And so the idea of this IDE is that it gives you everything that you need to program in Bella straight right there. So you can see you've got your setup function here, and you've got your render function here, and you've got your cleanup function here. The render function is called once every single audio block, and it gives you this thing here called context. And inside the context are your audio and analog buffers, which you can then access um, to, to get at the audio data. Sorry. No, it looks like it's not powered. Is anybody having, is, has anybody managed to get this IDE up and running? Is anybody having problems? We got this? Okay. okay. So Just if you've wait, got the IDE up and running, minutes, if you come over to the right-hand side here, there's a series of tabs. And this one with the folder icon is the most useful one. So in here, there's this example menu here where you can open some examples and see some code that's already running. So one of the most simple one is the kind of basic analog input. Um, and this will demonstrate to you how to basically access the context um, to get hold of the analog data and the audio data. And just if config USB zero. Um, another cool thing about this IDE, um, it has an inbuilt oscilloscope. Um, so if you open up, for example, the scope basic project from within this example thing, uh, and then click the run button over here, and then click the scope button, which is down here, this will open up and it will show you. So this patch is basically generating three sine waves in real time, uh, separated in phase. And then the uh, scope API is actually plotting them in real time so that you can see exactly what's happening on the board as it's happening, uh, which is very useful. Yes. So basically, you can program it from within the API here. And so you can send any variables that you have in your, prog in your program, including inputs from the analog or audio or any other variables that you like. There's a very simple API here where you basically just say scope.log and then you pick the symbols or the, the, um, the variables that you want to plot. And you have to call that once every single audio sample. Um, and then it will plot that to this scope over here. Uh, you can control the, how, the, how the scope is plotting things in here exactly like a normal oscilloscope. So you, you can trigger it based on the different channels. Uh, you can change the trigger mode and that sort of stuff. You can zoom right in and have a look at, or zoom right out, <laughs> and have a look at what's going on with the thing. So you can see here, these, these signals are sampled at 44 kilohertz. So you can actually zoom down and see the sampling rate. You can see the kind of the step-based sampling that's going on there. Um, so basically, that's a really quick introduction to how to use this IDE. There are, of course, several, several other ways, um, methods of programming with this. If you'd like to try, uh, we can have, I don't know, maybe, maybe if Julia wants to describe some of these. So we've got, like a, we've got a PD-based workflow where you can design your program in pure data. And then we use a cloud-based compiler called Heavy, which compiles it to optimize code uh, straight for Bella. And we have instructions for uploading and compiling with that. Uh, we also have another PD-based workflow using libpd, which is totally open source, this one. Um, and uh, we can also describe how to do that in detail a little bit later. 
Uh, there's also a Faust workflow, as we said before, and um, you don't have to use this IDE if you don't want to. You can also program on your own uh, and use some scripts to upload and compile to the board. Um, yeah, so if you come over here on the right-hand side of the IDE as well, it gives you a few options in here. So you can control the buffer size of your audio samples. Um, you can actually go right the way down to two audio samples. That means that you're you only get two audio samples of a in a buffer, and you have a very low latency of one millisecond. Uh, but you can also increase that in order to increase your kind of amount of programming capacity. What buffer size do people usually use? Well, so I always use two, because I like having the super low latency. Um, I do a lot of kind of um, feedback control with it, and obviously like low latency is really useful in that. Uh, so to give you an example of the different kind of performance that you can get at uh, with a buffer size of two samples, you can get about 500 wavetable oscillators. Um, and a buffer size of eight and above, you can get more like 800 wavetable oscillators. So you get quite a lot more processing power um, if you sacrifice a little bit of latency. And this is all running on the ARM chip? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Those kind of buffer sizes, the, the, most of the latency is in the converter, right? The yeah, for the, for the audio, uh, for the audio, Inputs and outputs. Most of the buffer, most of the latency is, is in that. The analog inputs don't have those converters, and so they don't have that latency. And you can actually get down to uh, around about 100 microseconds with those guys. If you want to do some PD stuff, yep. Oh, you've got that. Ho ho. Good. Um, yeah, I also need to mention that we. We haven't yet optimized. Uh, we, we are basically, the samples are read from the from the converter as integers, and then we converted them to float in the on the ARM chip. And we haven't properly optimized that yet. So this uh, uh, so this gap in the performance could be probably taken down a bit. So right now we probably have around 18% of CPU used just for running an empty loop, and that can probably be taken down to to a bit less, I guess, with, because we're using the vectorial floating point unit, which is not called vectorial floating point unit, but it's called Neon uh, on the ARM chip, and that uh, can run the same instructions with four instructions at a time. Sorry, I didn't want to show the Apple. Um, good. So, uh, yeah, these things just mentioned, and uh, so I don't think we're going to do a, a real, a real, sorry? Yeah, sorry, here we go. So we brought a few sensors, uh, FSRs and potentiometers. Do, do you have anything else? Piezas? Yeah. You have a few piezas. And? LDRs. LDRs, okay, good. Do you, have, do you actually have them? Yeah, Oh, amazing. Um, audio. Yeah, exactly. We better give them out. Uh, so the, out, the audio outputs, sorry, let me go back to the whole presentation mode. Uh, the audio outputs are the two 3-pin Molex, uh, the, the, two, the audio connectors are 3-pin Molex connectors on the side of the board, and they'll be carrying, I mean, each of the connectors carries a stereo signal. We're giving these 3.5 mils uh, um, cables, connectors, female connectors, but you can actually do whatever you want with them. Um, and whereas the analogs input and outputs will be on these on these um, headers, they're marked in orange and green respectively. You also have an I square C um, four-way connector just there. Uh, a more detailed pinout is available through the wiki, so you know exactly where what goes where. It's going to be here, and it's going to be here. At the top of the wiki, there's a link to the diagram if you need to con actually connect something. Um, good. So we should have bread breadboards as well. So they'll be they'll make it more fun, more easy to connect the uh, sensors. Do you have breadboards out yet? Good. Uh, before going into the proper uh, thing, I'll just show you a few work a few workflows that you can use with uh, Bella, so you can see if you want to do some C++ things, or if you want to use Pure Data, or Faust, or help me with Super Collider. Uh, so I'll just skip over all of this. Again, the pinout is on the, 
on the website, on the, on the wiki page. Why did I leave this line here? Am I running the, the wrong? I'm running the wrong presentation. That explains a lot. <laughs> I know actually that, that one was the wrong one. Uh, good. So, okay, so let's have a look at the C API. As you've seen in the, in the IDE, it looks like this. You just call these three functions setup and render and, um, and cleanup. Um, most stuff, mo most fun stuff happens in render where you get past this context variable. Uh, the context variable holds pointers to the imp analog inputs and, and analog outputs and audio inputs and outputs and digital inputs and outputs. And also contains sort of uh, interesting variables like the number of channels you run in, the number of uh, analog channels you run in, and the uh, sampling rate, which is, by the way, fixed at 44.1. Um, we have a couple of macros that allow you to uh, access, basically to read and write the buffers without caring about the fact that if that they're interleaved. Um, they're actually, they're not macros, but they are but the functions are probably in line by the compiler. Um, so yeah, I'll just have a look at what the, this context uh, variable uh, gives you. So they're gonna be in the code docs up here, and I think module, not classes, the thing at the top here. So again, you can find, if you've got the context audio in and context audio out will be the pointers to the audio in and out buffer, context analog in and context analog out will be the uh, analog, input and output buffers, and digital is sort of peculiar in the sense that uh, to do digital I.O. we're actually using a 32-bit word where half of that sets the direction and half of that sets the value or reads the value. So you'd, you'd be better using the, uh, the macros to read and write digital because you don't want to go down in bitwise operations. Uh, number of audio frames, all your channels, sampling rate, uh, all sort of things you, would, you could do, and also a counter of the samples that have elapsed so far. Now, before we give out any uh, wires and sensors and stuff, I need to tell you that uh, about the voltage tolerances. So you can plug up to five volts in a in analog input, although the converter is scaled between the the, the zero dB full scale is four point zero nine six volts, so you don't get much by plugging five volts. Don't plug something more than five volts in there. Uh, the analog outputs are five volts, uh, and the digital inputs and outputs, being they the actual beagle bonds GPIOs, they shouldn't get anything above three point three volts. Otherwise, you're gonna destroy the beagle bond. So yeah, be very careful what you plug in there. Um, okay, so that, that was it for the C++ API. Uh, we've recently worked with uh, Oli Larkin and Jan and Stefan Letts to get uh, a Faust, uh, a Bella target for Faust. Uh, so it's now already available through the online compiler. Just yesterday uh, I was speaking with, Jan, speaking with Jan and we found out that he up upgraded the um, compiler on the web server, on the server, and basically now the binary produced right now is not compatible with the, uh, with the SDs we have here. So if you want to compile Faust code, it's still possible. You just need to generate your CPP file and then put it in the, um, in the appropriate folder uh, on, um, uh, on the Bella, uh, uh, well, uh, and basically use the build project script uh, that you'll uh, find in the scripts folder uh, of the file that you already downloaded. And you use the script, the build project folder with this syntax here, you just run build project, and then you just give it a path to the file or to the folder that contains your C++ files and includes. And to control, to map uh, Bella analog inputs to, um, to uh, Faust, uh, you need to use something like this. I'm sorry, I never used Faust before. I only I only run the examples of the of the playground. Uh, but I tested these things and they work. So I, I'm not going to tell you what this thing is called, but um, that's how it works. Again, this is on the wiki, uh, if or on the slides. If uh, so, I'll now skip over this. Um, we got it to work with Super Collider. Again, uh, it's not just about creating an additional target for the. Uh, an additional audio server, an additional uh, whatever it's called, driver, 
in the case of Super Collider. Uh, but it's also about making sure that there are no mode switches in the audio thread. Uh, this, the issue with Super Collider was that uh, notify one function that was causing mode switch. Uh, anyhow, we got it to work, and the point is I don't know Super Collider, right? So, um, so I know I can run 120 sine waves and get 50% CPU time, but I don't know how that scales to practical use. So if there's anyone here that's familiar with Super Collider, have one image when it, where it runs, and if you want to play around with it, I'll be happy to uh, see what you can achieve. Uh, and then there's the whole pure data thing, which happens to be in another set of slides. Uh, as mentioned, you can use uh, you can use pure data patches in one of two ways. One is using the heavy audio compiler, which is oh, well, I go down here, and the other is using libpd. I assume you know what libpd is. Uh, so here's just a quick comparison between heavy and libpd. Uh, let me see if this thing goes full screen. Uh, 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 view, present. Yeah, great. Um, so, Heavy is an online service that takes your PD patches, analyzes the graph connections, and writes and gives you back optimized C code. It actually does many more things in the sense, in the, for us, gives us give, it gives us back C code that's, that all, has all the includes for ARM and actually compiles uh, very well on our platform. But you can do many more things. You can target uh, uh, JavaScript. Uh, you can target Unity, so C Sharp. And you can also download binaries of v VSTs. So you can turn your PD patch not, not just into a VST, as it would be using libpd, but uh, into something that's more optimized and runs much better, much faster. Um, and there's some performance things down there. Um, on the other hand, this thing, you could still do it with PD, right, and libpd, because there have been ports for um, other things like to for open frameworks or for JavaScript, or again I've seen something recently. It's called Camomile, I think, for uh, running VSTs, running PD into VSTs. Uh, downsides of heavy is that it requires an internet connection because the service is online. They don't share the binaries. They don't share the source code. Um, and then you need to compile it. And if you compile it on the board, it will take maybe one minute, which may uh, be less than what your average VST takes, but you may not be willing to wait for that. libpd, on the other on the other hand, you just you just run it. You just restart the pa the, the, the the binary once you upload update the patch, and uh, and it just starts immediately. But yeah, the really advan the great advantage of heavy is that it gives you optimized code. So if you compile it with Clung, you get maybe twenty five percent CPU time CPU usage on something that using libpd would take fifty five percent, and so. In an embedded platform like this, that's really useful. Um, so I'll just try this, see if it works straight away. It's not prepared. So we have a set of scripts, as mentioned. So I'll just go to the folder that I gave you, and scripts, and then I do build pd um, dash i, and that's probably where I have it. It's here, maybe. Uh, actually, I have one on the big one itself. Mm. Oh no, it's here. It's here and looks like this. Is it? Yeah. So I have this nice patch here. And uh, good. I do that and it should be enough. Almost. Except that I didn't do something, I guess. Um, Oh right, I need to give yeah over the body. I need to give the um, an address, the address of a fo the path to a folder. So I need to create a folder for it. Um. Good. Okay, so that already came back. The code already came back from the online compiler, which is very fast. And now it's probably hoping to run it on the board, assuming that my board is up. Yeah, there it is. File is copied to the board, and now it's run, copy, compiling. This is the first compile, so it's compiling also the core CPP files, but uh, future compiles will take a bit less. And this thing is plugged in here, so by the time it starts, you may be able to hear something. Yep. 
the core files take relatively little to compile. Um, uh, by the way, in the meantime, while that's compiling, I'll, so you see it's very easy, you just run a script and that does all the heavy lifting for you. Before that, the first time you'd run it, you need to have created an account on the on the website, and this again is down here in the wiki. Uh, compiling pure data pages for, no, here it is, running pure data pages on Bella. And that's where you find all the instruction to set up this thing. Basically, apart from what you've just seen of running a script, you need to first create a login. And the first time you run the script, you need to enter your credentials. Uh, but apart from that, you're all set. OK, it's still compiling. Um, alternatively, if you were thinking of running pure data patches using libpd, uh, there's already libpd compiled for this version. Uh, for this, on this SD image, there's already libpd in uh, slash user slash lib slash libpd.so. And on the, in the home folder, there should be a binary called, you go. so here's the batch running. Again, it took a while because it was the first compile. Uh, it will take, will take less uh, uh, in future compiles. If you want to run uh, libpd patches, then there's libpd bella binary file in the home of the bigger bond that we gave you. And that just run, loads the whatever underscore main.pd file is in, the, is in that folder. Uh, if I try to run it now, it will not run, because there's the other one still running. Of course, you can only run uh, one of these uh, programs at a time. But if I do this, then it will just run in libpd. Same thing running in libpd. Okay. Uh, I think we can skip over most of the rest and just and just see if you want to make something useful with it. Um, I'll just bring up a couple of diagrams on how to connect things. So uh, we have potentiometers, uh, force sensitive resistors. I don't think we have LEDs um, and piezo um, um, piezo mics. Uh, Piezo disks, actually. And so, yeah, I guess you know how to do these things, but I'll leave these on in case you need it. Uh, you have the slides online, anyhow. Good. So, I guess that, oh, well, there, are there any uh, other questions? Amazing. So, so, I think we can just play around with this. We'll be around to help you setting it up and getting to work. And hopefully, we'll come up with something useful by the end. <laughs>